the next topic I want to talk about is the work done by or against a gravitational field. Before we talk about that, we need to have two concepts straight. First, mass. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. If you've got an object, say, and it's got 10 trillion hydrogen atoms worth of mass in it, unless you start cutting pieces off of the object, that statement is true regardless of where the object is or how it's moving or whatever its environment happens to be. In the metric system, mass is measured in kilograms, while in the traditional British Imperial unit, the mass is in slugs. We'll avoid the slugs as much as possible. On the other hand, weight is a force, and a force is the response of an object to some external activity. For example, weight is a force. Weight is the force caused by Earth's gravity. The strength of gravity does depend on the position. When you get further away from a gravitating object, the force of gravity becomes weaker. So if I take an object that's sitting on the North Pole and lift it up some considerable distance, the mass is the same. The amount of material, the number of equivalent hydrogen atoms or something like that is the same, but the weight changes. The number of pounds change. And it should be understood that when I'm talking about the weight at this upper position, I'm imagining that you've got some platform that's being held still at that position and you're weighing the object. If it weighed 10 pounds here, it will weigh less than 10 pounds at the upper position. The units of force in the metric system, you use Newtons. In the British Imperial system, you use pounds. So if somebody starts talking about something having a mass of 10 pounds, they're confused. Pounds are forces, masses are amounts of material. In many cases, the distinction is not too important though. If you stay close to the surface of the earth, the weight of an object, the force, is the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity. If you stick close to the surface of the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity doesn't change much. So roughly speaking, the force is mass times a constant. But this is only an approximate idea, and it's only true as long as you don't move too far from the surface of the Earth. But for changes in position that are large, we need to know something about Newton's law of gravity. You're going to have two objects who have masses m1 and m2. The distance between the centers of the objects is going to be called x. What Newton postulated is firstly, the force of attraction of one of the objects on the other one is proportional to the product of their masses. Secondly, the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And thirdly, the force of one object caused by the other points along a straight line that goes from the center of one object to the center of the other object. If we write down all of those things as a formula, this says that the force is a constant times the first mass times the second mass divided by the square of the distance between them. This g is a universal constant, sometimes called Newton's constant. If you use meter kilogram second units, it's approximately 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 power. M1 and M2 are the masses of the objects, and X is the distance between the center of the objects. 
if we're thinking about problems involving the Earth and some smaller object, we'll think of X as being the distance of the object from the center of the Earth. Unless at least one of the two masses is gigantic, though, gravity is weak. Imagine that you have two one kilogram balls and they're situated so that their centers are one meter apart. The force on one object caused by the other one is, after all the arithmetic is done, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons. Force equals mass times acceleration, though. So the acceleration of each of the objects will be force divided by mass, which is 6 times 10 to the negative 11 meters per second squared. This is why in ordinary life, we don't see human-sized objects pulling on each other with strong gravitational forces. These gravitational forces are much smaller than things caused by friction and air currents and things like that. You'd have to do very careful, protected and controlled experiments in able to be able to measure such things. On the other hand, the mass of the Earth is pretty big. It's about 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The radius is about 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters to two significant figures. If I take a one kilogram weight and put it on the surface of the Earth, the force that the Earth exerts on the one kilogram mass is g times m1 m2 over radius of Earth squared. After you do the arithmetic, you get an estimate of about 9.74 kilogram meters per second squared. That is to say about 9.74 Newtons of force. The acceleration of the one kilogram object, if it were falling, the acceleration due to gravity is force divided by mass, which works out to be 9.74 meters per second squared in this case. The usually quoted figure is 9.8 meters per second squared. The roughness of the Earth's radius that I'm using is responsible for the difference. Now we can look at a problem that is similar to the spring problem, except it involves gravity instead of springs. We're going to take some object with a given mass or weight, depending on how we want to describe things. It's sitting on the surface of the Earth. It's r sub e units of distance from the center of the Earth, which is about 4,000 miles or 6.4 million meters, whichever units you like. We are going to, one way or the other, move this object until its distance from the center of the Earth is some number capital H. And I want to figure how much work was done. I've accidentally changed the name of H to capital D, but even so, we're going to do what you think we're going to do. We're going to chop the range of X values, which starts at R sub E and ends at capital D, up into a whole bunch of little subintervals. On each subinterval, we'll evaluate the force, we'll multiply it by delta X number I, we'll add them up and take the limit. And having played this game quite a few times already, it's no surprise that you end up with this definite interval to calculate. This is worth mentioning. This is generically true when you've got a force that depends on a single variable, x in this case. The motion goes along a straight line, up and down in this case, and you've got a formula for force as a function of x. Any kind of setup like that can be handled by this kind of interval. 
This time the force is not the spring force though, but the gravity force, g m1 m2 over x squared. So the work is going to be equal to equal to the integral from r sub e to d g m1 m2 over x squared with respect to x. If we assume that the masses are constants, then g m1 m2 is a constant also. I might as well call it k, and then the work is going to equal the integral of k over x squared with respect to x. This is extremely similar to the spring problem, except we're using the gravity force and not the spring force. For example, suppose you have an object that weighs 1,000 pounds on the surface of the Earth, that's a force now, and it is moved until it is 10,000 miles from the center of the Earth, which is about 4,000 miles, if you wanted to use British Imperial units. I'm gonna move it up to this 10,000 mile mark, as measured from the center of the Earth, meaning it's raised up 6,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. How much work was done? On the surface, the force was 1,000 pounds. On the other hand, the law of gravity says the force is also some constant k over x squared, where x is the distance from the object to the center of the Earth. If you manipulate this equation, you can easily figure out that k is 1,000 times the square of 4,000. Using my calculator, I find out that that's 1.6 times 10 to the 10 power. So force is 1.6 times 10 to the 10 over x squared, and there's no need to haul out the g and the m1 and the m2 here. Not only that, if I just wanted to call this number upstairs k, I could use all of my formula work with k instead of this literal number, and then only put the k in at the end when it's needed. Ignoring the pun at the beginning, the work is the integral from 4,000 to 10,000 of k over x squared dx, where the k secretly is 1.6 times 10 to the 10th power. Doing the integral in the routine way, we find out that the work is 2.4 million. You have to be careful about the units though. I'm measuring my distances in miles here and my forces are in pounds. So this is not 2.4 million foot pounds, it's 2.4 million mile pounds. Since we know that a mile is 5,280 feet though, we can easily convert that into foot pounds. Every reference to mile is replaced by a reference to 5,280 feet. And it works out that the work is 1.2672 times 10 to the 10 foot pounds. So we can see that it's very expensive in terms of energy to put something into space. That's over 12 billion foot-pounds of energy. Starting on the surface of the Earth, or close to the surface of the Earth, like in low Earth orbit, an object is given a push straight upwards, meaning away from the center of the Earth with speed v. This corresponds to having a kinetic energy, an energy of motion of one half times the mass of the object times the speed squared. I'm going to think of the mass of the small object as being m2. m1 will be the mass of the earth. As the object moves upwards, it loses speed because it's doing work against the gravitational field. And the expectation is eventually the gravitational field will have sucked all the kinetic energy out of the object. It will come momentarily to rest and then begin to fall back downwards again. 
a reasonable question to ask ourselves is, how far does it go? Or more generally, can I figure out a relationship between the initial speed, the place that the object starts at, and how far out it goes from the center of the Earth? So we want to look at this problem. The amount of energy traveling from x equal re to x equal d done against the gravitational field of the Earth will be this amount of work, as we've seen already. The initial kinetic energy is one half times m2 times v squared. When the work against the gravitational field has used up all of the initial kinetic energy, that means that the work done against the gravitational field is the same amount of energy that the object had to start with. So write in Newton's law, do the antiderivative, minus minus is plus again, which is why we write the one over r sub e out front instead of secondly. Multiply through by two, take the square root. The speed is two times Newton's constant times the mass of the earth times a number that is one over the reciprocal, one over the radius of the earth, that is, minus one over the distance out that the object travels. Suppose I want to make the capital D really big so that the object moves a very great distance away from the earth. And after that, I want to make the distance even bigger than that, and so on and so forth. What kind of speed, if any, corresponds to capital D tending to infinity. That is to say, the object never turns around. If you look at the formula for the velocity in terms of D, the only place D even figures into the thing is that one over D being subtracted away inside the bracket. As D tends to infinity, one over D tends to zero, the quantity inside the bracket tends to one over the radius of the Earth. As the velocity at the beginning approaches two times g times mass of the Earth over radius of the Earth, the capital D tends to infinity. This speed, this radical on the right part here, is called escape velocity for that reason. If you throw something upwards from or near the surface of the Earth with that much speed or more, then the object is not ever going to fall back to the surface of the Earth. It'll continue traveling outwards forever. It'll continue to slow down forever also, but the gravity of the Earth is not strong enough to bring it to a halt and let it fall backwards. Let's calculate this speed. Plugging in the numbers for g, the mass of the Earth, and the estimate for the radius of the Earth in meters, when the dust settles, we find out that escape velocity from or near the surface of the Earth is about 11,000 meters per second, which is 11 kilometers per second. One mile is 1.609 kilometers, so one kilometer is 1 over 1.609 miles. Likewise, since an hour has 3,600 seconds in it, one second is 1 over 3,600th of an hour. Every place I see the symbol kilometer, I'm going to replace it with 1 over 1.609 miles. And I'll do something similar for every place where I see the second. I'll write that in as 1 over 3600 of an hour. If you do the arithmetic, the speed that you get out of this is 24,978 miles per hour. And if you're familiar with 
space programs and satellite launches and stuff like that, you'll remember the quoted number for escape velocity is usually about 25,000 miles per hour. So we have figured this out for ourselves now. I want to finish this discussion with a demonstration of why you don't see these odd effects in everyday life. Going back through the work that we've done, the acceleration due to gravity is Newton's constant times the mass of the Earth divided by the square of the position from the center of the Earth that you're at. The X would be the 4,000 miles or 6.4 million meters. If you take the derivative of the acceleration with respect to x, the distance from the center, this tells me the rate at which the acceleration due to gravity changes with respect to changes in distance from the center of the Earth. If you split this up, if you take the negative 2 gm over x cubed, split off gm over x squared, which is the acceleration due to gravity, you'll have a factor of two over x left. So the derivative of acceleration with respect to position is negative of whatever the acceleration is times two over x. Roughly speaking, that means if you change the x a little bit, the acceleration due to gravity changes by about this amount, negative 2a times 1 over x. Multiply through by the number delta x, the change in acceleration is approximately negative 2 times whatever the acceleration is, times how much you change to the distance, divided by the distance from the center of the Earth. Suppose you had a building that was 100 meters tall. At the bottom, the distance from the center of the Earth to the bottom of the building is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. The distance from the top of the building to the center of the Earth, since the building is 100 meters high, is going to be the radius of the Earth with 100 meters added to it the change in the acceleration due to gravity between being at the bottom of the building and being at the top of the building will then be negative two times, I'll use the usually accepted figure 9.8 meters per second squared for the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth times how much you change to the X, which is 100, divided by how big X is, which is 6.4 million meters. After you do the calculation, you'll find that the change in the acceleration due to gravity is negative 3.0625 times 10 to the negative four. And naturally, that'll be in meters per second squared. If you want to get kind of a relative feel for how big this is, take the quantity, the delta A, and divide it by A itself, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, and express this as a percentage. Vertically, changing your position by 100 meters changes the acceleration due to gravity by negative point zero zero three percent you would have to have extremely accurate measuring equipment to even detect that this is why on a day-to-day -day basis we can pretend that the acceleration due to gravity is a constant as we move up and down even though it really isn't coming up next the amount of work done by an expanding gas and then we'll be done with the work section and we'll be moving on to look at methods of integration.